So recall that we've been on a quest to achieve security, meaning privacy and integrity of communicated data across an insecure channel under the influence of a shared secret key between sender and receiver. Authenticated encryption is the final chapter in that story where we reach the most important end goal, the one that we want routinely in applications. So far, we have considered Alice and Bob communicating across their public network where the adversary resides. And they have had two goals, privacy of the data, which protects the confidentiality of the message M, and authenticity, which gives Bob the guarantee when he gets a message claiming to come from Alice that it really did so and wasn't modified along the way. And we solved both of these problems by giving corresponding primitives and for each of them defining a security target and then assessing schemes and in particular providing ones that met it. For data privacy, our primitive was symmetric encryption. Example schemes were modes of operations of block ciphers like cipher block chaining, counter mode and so forth. The security target was the stringent INDCPA one, and we showed that certain schemes met it. Then we turned to data authenticity, and we provided a primitive called a MAC. It had a way to attach tags to communicated information so as to vouch for their authenticity. We had a security goal, UFCMA, and many secure tagging methods like CMAC, HMAC, and so forth. However, in these endeavors, we looked at the two goals separately. We first established privacy and separately we established integrity. But in practice, often we want the two simultaneously and that is not something we yet have. Why you might want this is of course fairly immediate. There are any number of um, applications or motivations out there, but a simple one is to go back to one of our starting examples of a medical practitioner wanting to send medical information about a patient to some medical database. The data needs to be private, private because medical records contain confidential information, but it also needs to be authentic to ensure that the entity that sends it is really the medical practitioner who was authorized to update that record in the database. So in the symmetric setting, the primitive that simultaneously provides both privacy and integrity, authenticity of the data is called an authenticated encryption scheme. So let's approach this the same way we've approached all our primitives. We start with the syntax, we then consider uh, defining a security goal using games, and then start looking at schemes. Syntactically, an authenticated encryption scheme is identical to a symmetric encryption scheme. Recall that means it's a collection of three algorithms, key generation, encryption, and decryption. Key generation is run once and it spits out a key that is then magically communicated to sender and receiver. Encryption takes the message and key to produce a ciphertext and is possibly randomized. Decryption is deterministic, takes the ciphertext and the same key as used for encryption and either recovers the message or possibly return some symbol indicating failure. And the adversary is sitting here. Of course, we have, as usual, the decryption correctness requirement, and then we turn to security. Now, we are interested in both privacy and authenticity, and a good part of our job, luckily, is done. Privacy is something we've already studied, and we defined INDCPA as the metric of interest. So when we talk about privacy for an authenticated encryption scheme, we just continue to mean INDCPA. However, integrity needs to be revisited. We have not yet defined any notion of authenticity for encryption. We defined it for MAX, but MAX and encryption are not syntactically the same objects. And we want something here that applies to encryption schemes. So we're going to look at this as follows, and it's quite simple. 
You imagine a sender transmitting ciphertext to a receiver and the receiver is accepting these ciphertexts. The adversary's goal is to get the receiver to accept a ciphertext even though the sender never sent it. And that, in other words, it's non-authentic. And we call that integrity of ciphertext. We don't worry about what the ciphertext encrypts. If the ciphertext itself is non-authentic, meaning it was never actually transmitted by the sender, then if the receiver accepts it, we have a problem. So let's turn that into games. We're quite experienced at doing this at this point, so we can go there directly. We fix our symmetric encryption scheme, and as usual, it's public, and we have this adversary A. Our game is called Integrity of Ciphertext, and it's associated to the scheme. As with most symmetric primitives, initialize picks a key at random by generating one according to this algorithm and then freezes it and it's secret. It's kept in this game for the rest of the playing of the game and is not given to the adversary. A set S is initialized for bookkeeping. Now to understand what integrity of ciphertext is trying to target, let's begin by looking here. The finalized procedure is capturing the receiver. When the adversary wants to try to win the game, it creates a ciphertext and outputs it. From an application perspective, it's sending it to the receiver Bob, but in the game it's just the adversary outputting it. What does the receiver do, which is what the game does? It decrypts this under the key K over here to get some output. As long as that output is some real data, meaning it's not the reject symbol, but rather is a string, the adversary wins, and otherwise it loses. That's it. So the adversary has a simple goal. Create a ciphertext that decrypts to something that's not rejection. The decryption succeeds. All you have to do is make decryption succeed and you win the game. Okay, but the adversary has a resource in trying to win this game. The real sender is encrypting messages, and this is creating legitimate ciphertext, which the adversary can examine and then use them to learn, perhaps, how to create other ciphertexts. We capture that by giving the adversary access to an encryption oracle. Again, not only can the adversary see ciphertext, but it can even pick the underlying messages it provides a message and the sender obligingly encrypts that message under the hidden key to get a ciphertext and gives that ciphertext back to the adversary. The adversary may say, okay, this particular message M say all zeros is going to be very helpful to me to create unauthentic ciphertext. Please encrypt it and the sender will do so. That's what the type of capability the oracle provides. Okay, if we leave it at that, it's very easy to win. All that the adversary has to do is go to this oracle, send in some message, get a ciphertext, and then output that ciphertext here. And of course, decryption will succeed because after all, it was created through encryption and decryption reverses encryption. But that's kind of cheating. Remember, the goal is that we want the adversary to win by creating unauthentic ciphertext but one that was sent by this oracle is not unauthentic, it's actually authentic because the sender agreed to transmit it. So we exclude that by collecting here all the authentic ciphertext, the ones produced through this process, and excluding them here. The one here has to be different from any of these. And now we have something non-trivial. As usual, there's an advantage because there's some probability of success and that's superscripted by the name of the metric, subscripted by the scheme whose security we're measuring, and is a function of the adversary. So we now know what we're looking for. When we talk about authenticated encryption, what we mean is it provides both privacy and integrity, meaning it's a single scheme. You can analyze it with respect to either this game 
or this game and it should be secure in both cases. So let's start thinking how we might get this. Well, we had some pretty nifty methods for encrypting to provide privacy. So an obvious starting point is, well, let's start there because we know they provide INDCPA and assess how good they are at providing integrity. So this is the cipher block chaining mode of operation where we have a block cipher E and encryption gives it a key K and then takes the message here, picks a random initial vector and then performs this chaining. It's added here and all that goes into here and, um, and the ciphertext is everything comes out here. And we remember that decryption works by um, using the inverse of the block cipher and reversing these steps over here. So is this, is this construction um, satisfy integrity? We know it satisfies privacy. What about integrity of ciphertext? Now, you don't need to examine it in great detail or to realize quite simply that the answer is no. Why is that? Because any string you write down has some valid decryption. So all that the adversary has to do is write down any random string, supply it to finalize, and the receiver will accept. Finalize will accept because it will decrypt. And although we have no idea what message comes out, the fact is that what comes out is not the um, rejection symbol. We can detail that here by writing a specific adversary. It happens to pick a three block ciphertext and then just returns it. So we usually like to write our adversaries in pseudocode like this, and here's a, how we can do that. What happens when we try to evaluate the INTC text advantage of A? This goes to finalize. What does finalize do? It runs this, and something will come out. Some message blocks will emerge through this operation, and so M will be returned. And that's it. You violated integrity of ciphertext, even though as an adversary, you have no idea what particular message the receiver constructs. It constructs something and it thinks Alice sent it, which wasn't true. We realize from that a lesson that may perhaps have been obvious had we started by thinking about it. Whenever you see a decryption algorithm that never outputs bot, you can't possibly have integrity of ciphertext because integrity of ciphertext means that adversarially created ciphertexts have to re have to result in bot decryptions. So this thing had better involve that bot somewhere. Okay, so let's try to do better than that. Now, um, as usual, what cryptographers did is say, okay, so cipher block chaining doesn't manage quite to get integrity, but it does have privacy, so we don't want to throw it away. How could we extend it a little bit to achieve integrity. And the idea they came about up with was encryption with redundancy. So the intuition for that is that if you create random ciphertext, they ought to decrypt to random messages. So if we can ensure that messages must have some structure, we can detect when things like that are happening. And this gets encapsulated into a family of schemes effectively, parameterized by a choice of some hash function. So again, let E be our block cipher, K bit keys and N bit blocks, and we have some function H mapping strings to uh, blocks. There are many choices for H. It could be something very simple like a constant function. It could be something that is a simple checksum on the data. It could be something called a cyclic redundancy code. It could be something cryptographic. You take some hash function like SHA-1, it returns 160 bits, which may be more than you need, so you take some fraction of them. Then the way you encrypt is that you take your message and you append as an extra block the hash of the message. And then you just go ahead and perform usual CBC. But Importantly, decryption is modified. 
so that when you decrypt, you check that the redundancy is present. So let's write that down in detail because it's important to know exactly how decryption works. So here's encryption. That's relatively straightforward. The way this is written is I'm letting SE be standard CBC encryption. So it has key generation K and let E prime and D prime be its encryption decryption algorithms, which we saw um, a few slides back. We are turning that into a new symmetric encryption scheme we're calling AE. And it works as follows. Encryption for AE uh, parses the message and breaks it into blocks, creates an extra block, which is the hash of the prior box. Hash function is public. And then applies CBC encryption with the key to the me original message with an appended extra block, which is this block over here. And that ciphertext is returned. Decryption in our authenticated encryption scheme gets a ciphertext C. What does it now do? It first runs CBC decryption, and that gives it an M plus one block message. It knows that this is the actual data, but before it outputs that, it'll check that the hash is correct. So it'll compute H on this data, and then if that matches up with the last block over here, then it'll say, okay, and it'll return the first M blocks as the data. And otherwise, crucially, it'll say, no, I'm going to reject. So why would we think something like this works? Well, the intuition again is that if an adversary simply writes down some ciphertext, when you decrypt with this block cipher under a key the adversary doesn't know, you should get kind of garbled nonsense up here. And the result is that the likelihood of the last block equaling each of the prior blocks is kind of small. It's, it's, it's a good intuition. Unfortunately, it's completely wrong. And what's interesting about the attack we'll see here is that it works regardless of the hash function. You can have a hash function of whatever simplicity or complexity you want, and nonetheless, there's an attack that violates integrity of ciphertext. How does it work? Remember that the adversary is allowed to obtain encryptions through the encryption oracle on a mess messages of its choice. It's going to start with a simple two block message. It picks one block any way it wants, uh, say at random, and now it needs a second block. And here's the trick. The second block is the hash of the first block. The adversary knows the hash function and it uses it in the attack. And it submits that message to the encryption oracle. Now, from the point of view of encryption, this is just data. It doesn't know or care that this is the hash of the prior one. It's a two block message. What does it do? Well, it follows our prior slide as far as encryption goes, which says, Compute the hash of this M1, M2, stick it here as a third block, and run CBC encryption. And so you get this out as a ciphertext. Good. So that is what the adversary gets back over here, this four block ciphertext. How does it now succeed in a forgery? It simply drops the last block. This whole part of the picture vanishes. And you see now that you have a valid ciphertext. Why is that? You have this two block message, it's encrypted correctly, and the second block here is a hash of the first. So it works for any choice of hash function with the caveat that that choice doesn't depend on the secret key. So there's still one thing more you could try here, which is having H depend on the key, but um, we'll do better than that, so we won't go there eventually. So this is a, a strong illustration of um, not only subtleties in, in design with regard to attack, but I think <clears throat> of having clear, strong, and formal game-based security definitions, because definitions enable us to see how to build attacks much easier. This is a real attack. Um, a scheme like this was used in an early design of a wireless encryption protocol 
and then this attack was provided to show that it, it, it was wrong and uh, they had to make other choices. All right, so we are trying to build um, authenticated encryption schemes and so far we failed. So let's back up and try to get it right. Now, we've already pointed out that we know how to achieve privacy and integrity separately. INDCPA encryption, we know several schemes, CBC, counter mode with, with our favorite block ciphers. That we did try to leverage an encryption with redundancy. But we also have something else. We have PRFs, which take you know, pretty much arbitrary length inputs and give us fixed length outputs. And we know that PRFs provide integrity because PRF security implies you have CMA. So our intent now is to glue these together. So we have many choices of encryption schemes, many choices of message authentication codes, HMAC, CMAC, encrypted CBC MAC. It should be possible for any pair of these choices to glue them together so as to get an authenticated encryption scheme. That would be highly desirable. It would give us a whole bunch of options and hopefully can be done quite simply. And indeed, if you think about the problem this way, a lot of natural candidates come to mind. How would you set this up? Well, if you want to combine these given ingredients, each of them needs a key. The natural thing then is our new scheme for authenticated encryption will have a key consisting of two parts, one for encryption, one for Mac, one to be used with SE, one to be used with F. So this one is created by running this key generation algorithm and this one by picking at random from 0, 1 to the K and that pair is returned. So we know now how key generation works. We'll have to think about how the other algorithms work. Before going on, let's just recap what we're given. We are given this encryption scheme SE and we can assume it provides INDCPA privacy. We have all three of these algorithms and we'll invoke them. We don't necessarily know or care specifically what scheme it is. We need or want security only assuming INDCPA of that scheme. Similarly, we know we have a PRFF and we can invoke it but we're not going to try to assume it has some particular design. Now, it's quite natural when you approach gluing together encryption and authentication methods to see that there's a number of ways to do it, which is pretty much a question of in what order you apply the two primitives. You can first encrypt and then authenticate. You can first authenticate, then encrypt. Um, I misspoke the first time. You can encrypt and authenticate in parallel. That's called encrypt and MAC. You can first authenticate, then encrypt. That's called MAC, then encrypt. Or you can encrypt first and then authenticate, which is encrypt, then MAC. All of these are actually used in practice in different real-world protocols, and we're going to study all of them. Now, before we get into the study, <clears throat> maybe it's worth looking at a bit of the context and history and motivation over here. This is a um, prominent and important question. Here, for example, is Matthew Green, a well-known applied cryptographer, who has a very popular blog, and in it he's discussing how to choose an authenticated encryption mode. And he talks about how he likes to complain a lot, and one of his favorite complaints is dumb crypto standards. So what is dumb about it? It is that they will say something, they will do something like use unauthenticated CBC encryption mode and provide that as an option in their web encryption standard. And routinely, he points out this leads to errors. And what you really need is authenticated encryption. And it ought to be mandated. And when he tries to tell them that, they complain mandating encryption would be hard um, and so forth. But um, what he points out is that it, that isn't true. You 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 sh can and should uh, design authenticated encryption schemes and um, and use them. And the most important lesson for us here is nearly all the symmetric encryption modes you learned about in school textbooks and Wikipedia are potentially insecure. What does he mean? 
CPC mode isn't insecure if all you want is IND CPA. The lesson is that most likely you want more than that. You also want INTC text, that you really want authenticated encryption, even if you don't know it. And so you need to enhance your encryption modes to be authenticated. And he points out to the slew of attacks, things like the padding oracle attack and many other famous ones, which result in complete decryption of data. Why? Because no authentication was performed. And then he goes into solutions. We can look here at the padding oracle attack. We don't have to go through it in detail, but it's a fascinating sort of clever attack in which you play around with cipher block chaining and exploit the lack of authenticity to um, target uh, a receiver in such a way that you can actually obtain, obtain uh, decryptions, right? And uh, it's scary. Okay, so that hopefully is some motivation to figure out how to get this right, and in particular to study these, which are called composition methods, generic composition methods, the most popular ways to build authenticated encryption. We're going to do this in a kind of conversational way where I'll write down schemes and we'll just discuss intuitively whether they work or not. So Encrypt and Mac is doing encryption and Mac in parallel. Remember, we're trying to design this scheme given um, encryption prime and decryption prime, which work to provide privacy only. So my encryption algorithm takes an encryption key and a Mac key and a message. I need to provide both privacy and integrity. That looks quite easy. I encrypt the message using my given scheme to get a ciphertext. That gives me privacy. I authenticate the message using my Mac or PRF with the Mac key. That gives me authenticity. So I return this ciphertext together with this tag, and I should have privacy and authenticity. Decryption must check, however. So it takes the same key, this composite ciphertext, and what does it do? It first decrypts using the base INDCPA scheme applied to this ciphertext and gets back the message. Now it checks the tag. It has the uh, MAC key. It can compute the correct tag on this message. That's this value here. Check if it matches the tag that was in the ciphertext. If so, authenticity is assured. I can return M, otherwise I signal a problem. Okay, so now let's look at those schemes and ask one by one whether privacy and integrity are achieved. Remember, we need both these properties to meet the authenticated encryption goal. What about privacy? Well, we are encrypting, right? And we know that E prime works. So surely we've achieved privacy. No, we haven't. And this is where we start seeing a subtlety. Why have we lost privacy? Because we did more than encrypt. We, we also included this stuff and we put it over here. But this tag actually violates privacy of the message. Why is that? Because it's a deterministic function of the message. In other words, if I twice encrypt the same message, I will twice see the same tag. And most likely, if different messages are different tag. And that allows us to detect repeats, and in particular, leads to a violation of INDCPA. And if you like, you can go and for formalize that and write down an actual attack that shows that you can use the tags to violate INDCPA. So that's interesting. You have This is why you have to be careful with this composition that the two things being possible separately doesn't mean it's all possible ways of gluing them together work. Does this guarantee integrity of ciphertext, however? Um, it turns out it doesn't even do that. Um, why is that? Because what if you could modify this ciphertext in such a way that its decryption is unchanged. If that's the case, the MAC will still check because the MAC is on the message. So an unchanged decryption will um, still verify correctly. So if I could, if this was possible, I could obtain a ciphertext through an encryption oracle, 
modified so his decryption is unchanged. But now I have a new ciphertext which will be accepted over here. So I won't have integrity of ciphertext. Okay, well, we're off to a pretty bad start. So let's try something else. We realize that you can't just give up the authentication tag in the clear because that violates privacy. So let's do the next obvious thing. We'll encrypt it. So now I first compute the authentication tag on the message using the MAC key. When I encrypt, however, I encrypt not just the data, but also that tag so that I provide privacy. And this is all done with the base scheme. And now I return this one ciphertext. How does decryption work? If you give it that ciphertext, it decrypts under the base scheme using this key over here. And it gets something that has two parts, message and a candidate tag. It, however, now checks that the tag is valid. How? The same way as before. It knows how to compute the correct tag on the message. That is simply by running F with this key. And then it checks that it matches the tag in the ciphertext. If so, you return the message, otherwise fail. OK, have we succeeded now? Do we have privacy and integrity? So let's look at them one by one. Now, it takes a little bit of a, a looking, but my claim is that actually we did well for privacy. And although one could write a formal proof of that, the intuition is that all the adversary sees is encryptions under this scheme. And this scheme is good. It provides privacy. So it doesn't really matter what we have here. The only thing visible to the adversary is ciphertext under uh, a scheme that we know to be good with a key the adversary doesn't know. And so privacy will work out fine. OK, so if we got integrity as well, things would be nice. But in fact, we didn't. Why is that? The same problem as before um, continues to exist, which is that it may be possible to modify the ciphertext C in such a way that its decryption is unchanged. We can give examples of uh, algorithms E prime for which that is true, and yet these algorithms do satisfy Andy CPA. And if that happens, you can send a certain message to the encryption oracle, get a ciphertext, modify that in such a way that the decryption is unchanged, submit the new ciphertext to finalize, and decryption will succeed and you'll win. So no integrity of ciphertext so far. OK, but there's still one more thing left to try. Let's change the order. We'll first encrypt, then authenticate. OK, how does that work? I go back as an encrypt and Mac to encrypting the data with my given INDCPA scheme and the encryption key by itself and getting a certain ciphertext. Now, in encrypt and Mac, I had tagged the message, but that was not a good idea because I can't reveal that tag for fear of compromising privacy. So instead, I'll tag the ciphertext. I'll put the Mac on top of the ciphertext here, and then I'll send that across. How does decryption work? It receives this pair over here, and now it decrypts under the base scheme this first part to get the message. And then it checks the tag. It has the F function and the key case of M. It computes the correct tag on this partial ciphertext and sees if it matches the one provided in this ciphertext. If so, return the message, otherwise bought. Let's return to our analysis. Do we have privacy? Well, the claim is we actually do. Now, you might worry that we are tacking on some stuff here, this tag, and this tag may reveal something about the data. But the fact is the tag is a function of a ciphertext. And some, in other words, it's, it's computed on top of something that already hides M. And so it can't, it can't reveal M. Um, an adversary could always compute this itself. In, indeed, you have privacy even if you give the adversary the case of M key so that it can compute these tags itself. Okay. And we'll see that in a little more detail later. But intuitively, yes. And um, also happily, we have integrity of ciphertext. 
Why is that? Because this tag will ensure that C prime cannot be modified. So you cannot, for example, change it to the in such a way that the decryption is unchanged. Because anytime you just try to flip any bits in C prime, it will be detected through this tag. And again, that's very high level, but we can see that in more detail later. So this has been a little subtle. We have all these different ways, some work and some don't. And again, we can look at um, the interest and repercussions of things like this. So for example, um, here is a blog post again, and it's explaining why Mac then encrypt doesn't work. That's exactly what we've just seen. But this is a very real world example because um, SSL or early versions of TLS actually use Mac then encrypt. And that led to a whole slew of attacks. Um, you can see interest on this again in things like um, Stack Exchange where someone asks, should we Mac then encrypt or encrypt then Mac? And so, and then answers are provided to these questions, including by well-known people like Moxie Marlinspike, who is the designer of the Signal uh, secure messaging app, um, is talking about this and explaining things and so forth. And this is a long, serious discussion. A lot of it is the things we've said. And so we see that, you know, we would have been able to answer this over here. We also see that um, the wisdom about which type of composition to use has reached um, these applications. So here for TLS is an RFC which specifies the good method, encrypt then Mac. This was used in TLS 1.3. So they changed over to from something that didn't work in earlier versions of TLS which use Mac then encrypt to something that did. Okay, so um, now one might comment that the authenticated encryption scheme we've designed has a longer key than the original privacy only encryption scheme because it needs both an encryption key and a Mac key. That might be okay, but if you feel like you want a short key, you can always obtain it by starting from a single key K, which you use as your authenticator encryption key, and then somehow deriving the other two in some way. For example, by applying a PRF under K to certain constants. And uh, given that, we won't need to get into something like that. But one reason, or the main reason to actually explicitly say this, is that you might try to shortcut the use of two keys by saying, oh, let's just use the same one for both. That can lead to lots of problems and, and it may not work. So here's an exercise where you're given uh, a composition. So you're given a candidate authenticated encryption scheme created out of um, a block cipher using sort of variants of um, uh, CBC and you're asked to assess security. So you're asked a bunch of questions about it which are exactly the same as we saw in our uh, three composition methods. Does it satisfy privacy? Does it satisfy integrity? And then to get you some understanding whether it is one of these composition methods or not. And in case you might want to try this exercise, I'll give you some indications or hints. It's actually not this composition method for a subtle reason, which is exactly that it reuses keys and effectively what this example shows us is why reusing keys is a bad idea. All right, so now um, let's justify the security claims about Encrypt and Mac, right? So we claimed it's both INDCPA and INTCTEC secure under the assumptions that the base primitives work. So let's see what those statements mean and why they're true. So let's let SC be our starting symmetric encryption scheme and F our starting family of functions from which we build the authenticated encryption scheme uh, in the encrypt and MAC combination method that we saw a few slides back. So now we have an authenticated encryption scheme and I'm worried about INTC text off it. 
Let A be an adversary attacking the INTCTX security of the scheme. And of course, it's playing the INTCTX game, so it has some resources, a certain number of queries to the encryption oracle, and a certain running time. I want to claim that uh, this adversary won't do well, and hence INTCTX security holds, and that would be because F has PRF security. And so the, what the theorem says is I can construct an adversary B attacking the PRF security of the function family F such that this equation is true. So whatever advantage this achieves is not mo much more than the PRF advantage of B, more by just a little bit over here. So if PRF security holds, INTC tech security holds. Now notice that this scheme was INDCPA secure. It turns out that doesn't matter for this claim. I don't care even that it is or whether it is or not. Merely the PRF security of F is going to guarantee the integrity of ciphertext of the AE scheme. So this is another proof by reduction where we build a PRF adversary. And we've seen a few of these, so hopefully we should be able to do this at a fairly brisk uh, pace. So our job is to design an adversary B that runs A as a subroutine and uses it to violate PRF security. B has an FN oracle and is trying to determine whether that FN oracle is coming from the real world or the random world. It runs A, but A needs an encryption oracle. So B needs to provide that encryption oracle. How does it do that? Through some subroutine that it provides in its place. Now, how can it um, create ciphertext for A? It has two goals. It has to create them, but somehow it has to involve Fn in the process. So now here comes one of the tricks here that um, is, is quite general. The encryption key for the authenticated encryption scheme is simply chosen by B. It, it picks it itself and thus knows how to encrypt. So here, remember the encryption needs to provide is an encryption under case of B of the message followed by a MAC on this ciphertext. It can easily do this because it knows case of B. How is it going to get a MAC on the ciphertext? Well, it doesn't directly. Instead, it asks its FN Oracle to please supply that. Okay. And in the real world, of course, it's exactly what it wants. For bookkeeping purposes, you record the pair C prime and T, and then you return this as the ciphertext. Okay, eventually A will say, I'm ready, I'm going to output to finalize my forgery. What does B do? It just checks whether A won the INTCTX game. First of all, if this pair was already in the set S, then A would lose the game because it's not new. And so B says, no, I'm going to return a zero, meaning I'm going to guess I'm in the random world. If this pair is not an S, then it checks whether the tag is correct. And it does that again relative to its own FN oracle in place of the tagging function. And if that check works out, it says, I think I'm in the real world, else in the random world. OK, that's our description of B. And now um, we want to analyze it. We have to do that separately in the two worlds. B is playing either the real or the random game since we're looking at PRF security for B. So when you look at executing B in its real game, this is F sub K for some key K chosen by the game. That key is identified for us mentally with K sub M, the MAC key. When you make that identification, you see that this turns into exactly the execution of A in the INTC text game. The tags are completely correct. This check is the one finalize would make, and they're identical. And hence, since A, B returns one exactly when A succeeds in violating uh, the INTC text game, the probability of returning one is just the advantage of A in violating INTC tech security. OK, now we turn to the random game. Again, we have the same B. We run it in the game 
where fn is returning random stuff. As we've seen sometimes before, when random stuff comes back here, A is going to get pretty confused because these don't look like the kind of tags it expects. So we don't really know what it might decide to do or to output, but it'll output something. And the only way a one can be returned is if this pair is new and t equals fn of c prime. But fn is a random function. So if c prime has not been called on for it before, there will be a 1 in 2 to the n chance that this succeeds. If it has been called before, then in fact here there's a 0 chance. Why? Because t is by definition wrong, because otherwise you would be inside the set s. Okay. You have to put all those things together and conclude this. And then you subtract these two equations, play around a bit, and get the theorem. We had a second claim that the encrypt and MAC method also preserves privacy. So it provides INDP CPS security. And it turns out this is true because of the assumption of the same on the base encryption scheme. Here's the theorem that captures that. We start with our given IND CPS secure symmetric encryption scheme. We let F be the family of functions used as a MAC. We let AE be the encrypt and MAC scheme constructed as we've seen before by composing these two. I'm interested in INDCPA security, so let A be an adversary trying to violate that. It plays the INDCPA games uh, left and right and has some resources. Remember there the oracle is left or right LR. So A makes some number of queries to that and has some running time. I want to show that the advantage of A is small. How do I do that? I bound it above by the advantage of an adversary I construct B, who is also actually violating INDCPA, but of the base scheme. It's looking at this scheme, which we assumed INDCPA secure, and saying whenever you violate privacy for this scheme, I will violate privacy for the underlying one. Since I assume this one is secure, this number is small, and so is this. And the resource usage of B is about that of A. Okay, so another proof by reduction, and not too difficult. What do we have to do? We have to design an adversary B violating INDCPA security of the SC prime scheme. How does it work? It has to run A, and since A wants a left or right oracle, B has to simulate that. So it needs a subroutine to do that. As per left or right, this subroutine has two inputs, messages of equal length, and it needs to provide the encryption of one of them. Now, what B will do is it'll call its own left or right oracle on those messages to get a ciphertext. Effectively, it wants to provide this ciphertext. So it sticks that in as part of the ciphertext provided back to A. But remember, A needs an encrypt and MAC ciphertext. So it needs on top of this a MAC. So B needs to provide this MAC. How does it do that? It says, I will just pick the MAC key myself. And thus I can simply compute that MAC over here and stick it in. And so this is a perfect simulation of the oracle that A expects. Whatever A's guess is as to whether it's in the left or right world, B makes the same guess. And um, it's not hard to see that the uh, this simply preserves all the probabilities. The chance that B attacking a C prime uh, in the right world returns a 1 is the same as the chance that A attacking A in the right world returns a 1, and similarly for left. And when you subtract these, you get the theorem statement. Good, so we have encrypt and MAC. And one of the important takeaways now is if you want an authenticated encryption scheme, we have a good way to get it. And not only is it uh, a way, it's many ways, because there are so many different choices for the two components based on what we've studied before. So what this exercise does is to ask you to justify some of the no claims on our uh, prior slides. So it's asking you to 
show that encrypt um, Mac then encrypt um, uh, fails to satisfy INTCTX security. And it sets you up in sort of counterexample mode. It says build a base encryption scheme SC prime such that it's INDCPA, but when you compose it with F, you don't get an integrity of ciphertext. You have to do this for a given F, and you're allowed to use some other INDCP encryption scheme in building yours. Why is that? Otherwise, it's not at all clear how you can possibly ensure that this one is INDCPA. So that's a nice little um, exercise to play with. All right, now, subsequent to all of that, there has been an evolution in how symmetric encryption is viewed. This uh, covers both privacy and integrity. And the change is that rather than algorithms that are randomized, we have ones that are deterministic, but take an input called a nonce. Perhaps the simple way, simplest way to think about it is that you externalize the choice of the randomness. If you think of some higher level application as having the job of picking the randomness and the encryption is simply taking it as given and being deterministic, you have your first sense of what is going on here, but it's actually more general. So now the setup is E and D are deterministic and the sender has a key this quantity called a nonce, a quantity called associated data, and of course the message. As a function of all of those, it deterministically computes a ciphertext and transmits it. The receiver gets this ciphertext from the sender and is presumed to already have the key nonce and associated data. We'll discuss later why it, it can be assumed to already have them. It can then decrypt deterministically and recover the message. So these are our quantities of which these two are new. So let's uh, think about what they are. Um, as long as you don't reuse a nonce, the scheme is supposed to provide both privacy and integrity in the following way. You provide privacy and authenticity of the message as before, and the associated data you provide authenticity, but not privacy. What can you use as nonces? You could use random numbers, and then you're kind of back to all we've been seeing before. But you could also use counters. They don't repeat. You could even use other things, packet numbers or uh, section um, numbers in, in memory or whatever. Anything that doesn't repeat is supposed to be enough to get this to work. So it's more convenient, more general, and so forth. What is the point of associated data? It turns out in applications, you may want to communicate something for which you only want authenticity and not privacy. In particular, you can't afford to encrypt it because um, it carries information that's, rel that's needed to decide how to perform decryption, for example, even which key to use or something like that. So now this kind of scheme is, um, is getting more and more popular in standards. So there are a few subtleties to be careful about with regard to AEAD, associated encryption, authenticated encryption with associated data. Um, if you look at the formal definitions of security, they will be given by games in our usual style, and we're not going to do it here. But they assume the setup here. They assume that the receiver has all these quantities. and one may ask then, of course it has the key, but how does it get the nonce and associated data? And a, an implementer has to think about those questions because the formal model doesn't answer them. It effectively says that the receiver magically obtains them. And the understanding is that they're out of band communicated. So in other words, the, the formalism says that's not our problem. So what could you actually do? Well, associated data, you can just send it with the ciphertext. You're not trying to protect privacy anyway, and it's fine to just send it. It's the nonce where we have subtleties. 
In some cases, it may be known to the receiver. For example, when a AED is used in TLS, it's a counter, and both the sender and receiver maintain that count, counter and sync. So effectively, the receiver already knows what the counter either is or should be, and that's enough. Sometimes it's a random number, in which case you might transmit it. But the subtle point is that you cannot always transmit the nonce along with the ciphertext. Doing that for some choices of nonces compromises privacy. Now, privacy of what? Of the message. This message M, whose privacy you're trying to protect, can have its privacy compromised if you reveal the nonce. This would happen for certain types of choices of nonces, in particular ones that depend on the message. But the thing is that AEAD allows those choices. And so you have to be very careful that if you make choices like that, you have to find some alternative way to reach the nonce to the receiver. And this subtlety is not too well understood in um, standards and usage. So let's quickly look at what's known about building these AEAD schemes. First of all, given that we've changed the syntax and model, we need to revisit generic composition. And when we do that, we, found that we find that the methods that didn't work before can actually be made to work under appropriate conditions and assumptions on the base schemes. Um, all of them now actually provide both integrity and privacy. So it's kind of a nice feature of um, AAD and the introduction of nonces and also the um, understanding that most base schemes satisfy certain conditions that enable these properties to always hold. There was then a slew of work that designed um, good AAD schemes. And the intent here was to go beyond generic pawn position in order to get speed. Remember that in generic composition, you make one pass to encrypt and then another pass to authenticate. So you go over the data twice. So effectively, you have twice the cost of either privacy or integrity alone. But schemes like this have a cost to provide both privacy and integrity that's only marginally more than the cost for privacy alone. So they kind of cleverly integrate the two and uh, take advantage of that to, to reduce the cost. There are, however, also other two-pass schemes which are specific in the sense that rather than leaving it at the point of saying, oh, good, just go pick your own base schemes and do encrypt the Mac, they say, no, we're going to kind of do it for you by making specific choices of the base schemes, perform some optimizations, perhaps use just one key and glue it all together. Because when we glue it all together, there's less likely to be errors. The most popular there is GCM. You can also design other schemes in other ways, for example, based on stream ciphers. Uh, historically, one of the reasons that two-pass schemes have in fact percolated much more into usage compared to the faster one-pass schemes is not security, they're equivalent, but patents on one-pass schemes, and that precluded um, widespread adoption. This is a description of one of the fastest one-pass schemes, so OCB, Offset Codebook Mode. So we won't do these things in detail, but roughly what it does is it introduces this idea of tweaking a block cipher. You kind of add an additional input to a block cipher written in a superscript, which allows it to act as though the key were different for each choice of tweak. So here when I run it and here when I run it, although the key is the same, it behaves as though they were actually different. And the scheme will simply apply the cipher separately to different data blocks, um, generate a checksum, and then um, output uh, that. And um, this, this checksum, um, is communicated then along with the data as part of the authenticity tag. Uh, and this method is 
quite attractive, although limited by patents, and thus in standards it tends to be optional. It's an interesting story as to the development. OCB evolved into OCB 2 and 3, which made refinements that made things a little more efficient. And OCB 2 was broken, and the original and number 3 stand. This is despite all of them being claimed to have proofs of security. So it's a lesson about um, doing proofs correctly, not just doing them. Uh, CCM is another scheme in which um, it's effectively a, a generic composition, except that things are done to optimize here and there. You use counter mode encryption on the message, take the associate data nonce and message and perform a kind of encoding, Mac that, and then kind of mask that at the end over here. The most popular one is GCM because that's used in TLS. That also starts with the counter mode encryption based on the nonce and message, and then encodes the ciphertext with the associated data, and then uses a special hash function called the GCM hash function, which is what's called a, a universal hash function. This is a way to do fast message authentication by taking a hash and then kind of um, encrypting it through the addition of a, the, of a mask created from the nonce by a block cipher. Um, and this is in a government standard, and again, it's in TLS. When you look at performance comparisons, they show you the gap between one and two pass schemes. OCB is almost as efficient as electronic codebook mode. Remember, electronic codebook mode is kind of the minimal basic thing you can do, which is just apply a block cipher to each block. You will get, at best, only privacy. In fact, as we know, not even that if you want INDCPA. But OCB is marginally less efficient and provides high privacy, INDCPA, plus integrity. And GCM and CCM are slower since they're two-pass schemes. And this plays itself out on different platforms. You can see a comparison for 64-bit architectures. OK, so where are we now? Well, if you're looking for authenticated encryption, you have many choices. You have these fast one-pass schemes, which are actually very recently have become patent-free um, extensions of them. And then you have these interesting two-pass schemes, GCM and other ones as well. And the interest in authenticated encryption is so high that people are still looking for new schemes and decided to do this again through one of these standard competitions to establish a new standard. We can take a look at that. This one is not run by the government. It's run by a cryptographer. And you can see how the standard has evolved, what its timeline was, and what kind of uh, submissions have been done. So we can look here at the different submissions. And as you see, the selection has a few, there are a few different um, spaces for um, selections. And you see here that OCB actually made it as one of them, and then others made it in other categories. And as with these competitions, you see the evolution where they start out with lots of candidates over here, and then some drop out due to security problems, some are withdrawn, others are just evaluated and found to be not as good as others, and eventually we arrive at these. So yet another place to get more authentic encryption. And with that, kind of the concluding, concluding takeaway and lesson is use authenticated encryption. When you are in a position where you need to use symmetric crypto, 99 times out of 100, the right answer is grab a good authenticated encryption scheme, and that is what you need, and it's all you need, and that's the way to go.